Hey, this is Jack Bourne, founder of DeadlineFunnel.com, and today we have another case study with a successful Deadline Funnel client. I'm extremely excited for this conversation uh, because we're going to be talking about uh, virtual summits. I have Naveed Moazes with us, and he's an expert when it comes to virtual summits. That's what he teaches. It's what he does. And so we're going to dive into that. We're going to be talking about uh, things that work with virtual summits, who they're for, mistakes that people make, and uh, things like that. We're also going to be talking about using urgency inside of uh, virtual summits and maybe even how to evergreen a virtual summit. So this is a topic I'm really interested in. So Naveed, great to have you on the call. Thanks so much, Jack, for having me. This this is great. Deadline Funnel has changed a lot for me for my last summit. I'm so grateful that obviously Cody actually told me about, I knew about Deadline Funnel, but I think Cody Lister just kind of, I introduced him to virtual summits and then it was more like he was using it for his content promotion summit and I was taking it to the next level on list building school I hosted in 2016. So happy to dive into any of that today. Cool, cool. Well, yeah, so you mentioned Cody. That's um, Cody Lister who uh, was on another interview that we did and he really uh, was very generous with sharing exactly um, how he ran his virtual summit and he credited you with a lot of, um, a lot of what, what he did successfully. So um, tell us about your business. Kind of give us the, 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 the context of, of how you got started in virtual summits and, and maybe let's take it from there. Yeah, so it always starts kind of with a struggle, right? That's how it was for me. I had the, the podcast, kind of that's where I started. I did a lot of interviews, I had blogging, but I found that it didn't really grow my email list that quickly and I wasn't generating that much money. And then I stumbled across, I think it was from some health summits or whatever it was that I saw they were doing really successful summits where they were growing their list and they were generating actually a lot of money as well from those free summits, but on the back end they were profiting and then I was like uh, studying that a lot and I actually hosted my own one, uh, summit in 2014 uh, without any prior knowledge or experience. I just walked through their funnels and actually studied what they did and re-engineered that. And then I had some great success with my first one, the branding summit, uh, generated about uh, 3,000 email subscribers and $20,000 in profit from that first summit, which enabled me to quit my job and move abroad. And then I got so many questions of other people asking me how you know, I hosted summits and then I started teaching them and having clients and eventually Virtual Summit Mastery was born, which is my premium flagship program today. So what are some of the purposes for a, a virtual summit? Like, is it is it primarily to create revenue or is it to really get known in the marketplace and, and possibly build yep. your list? It can be a kind of a little combination because I want, when I started, it has different stages. And I, what I love about summits, it can work at any stage of business. It can work in any market as well. I've even seen it for software companies, quite successfully teachable. They are doing one right. currently at a time of this recording. I've seen Drip by lead pages. They've done one. I think also uh, Thinkific, they've even done one. So I see a lot of even software companies in, in addition to more expert, uh, you know, experts and, uh, and uh, thought leaders who are doing summits to kind of expand. But I've seen people who are starting out, they can use summits really successfully. And I can see, I've seen people who want to grow from let's say a five, high five, six figure business to seven figures, they have used summits as well. And uh, I was at that stage in 2014 when I wanted to level up. So I said, I want to be known in the marketplace. So I did a summit, but I also wanted to grow my list and I didn't have a product at the time. So the summit actually became my product. And I sold an all access pass in the back end of my sum uh, of the free summit. So people sign up. I am sure Cody actually walked you through uh, the funnel. So people people sign up. They, it's free to sign up for. And then on the thank you page, you actually that's where deadline funnel comes in too, which you can talk about. But then on the thank you page, uh, then you upsell them to an all access pass to have like 67 to 97. Typically, it depends a little bit on, on your market, but. Most of the time, we've seen 67 to 97 works pretty well, and 67 being the kind of sweet spot for where you should have the kind of the deadline funnel, and then it goes up to 97. And you can profit right there. Even if you don't have a product yet, that can be your first product, and then you can actually serve your audience you're building with that summit, and, you know, and then launch a course or promote an affiliate product to them. So there's so many benefits there, in addition to just the influencers you get to meet, and they can become your partners and friends as well. Very, very cool. So, um, so yeah, let's let's focus on the front end of the of the funnel. So, when 
and I know that this is getting kind of in the weeds, but I'm curious about this part. So the, the summit is free to some, for someone to sign up. And, I, and uh, I think the way that most people set it up is that um, if you sign up, you're going to get the, the um, details about when these different events are. And if you attend all the live events, then it's completely free, right? But the yeah, so it's kind of you can have it pre-recorded or live, but like it runs as it's live, you know, during so this like a set period of time, let's say four to seven days typically, something like that is you know a good summit with twenty to thirty experts. And I tend to say that summit is like a webinar on steroids because it's kind of like instead of just featuring one expert, maybe you're partnering with someone with a webinar and they are promoting to their list. With a summit, you can partner with twenty to thirty experts and let's say you know, a handful of them promote promote your summit to their email list. They introduce you to their audience. That's pretty good. So you actually grow your list with, you know, per, per expert you have on, hundreds to thousands of people come come into your, to your summit at any given time. And if you are more seasoned, let's say you are already have a lot of relationships or you have a solid business, you can get, you know, Ten, tens of thousands of leads from one virtual summit. And for my last one, I got 26,070 uh, people coming in and 2,100 uh, customers for, for list building school. And I credit a lot to that success, actually, in terms of the customers, at least to Deadline Funnel, because we had that $67 offer on the thank you page and it converted like crazy. In the beginning, I think when I had just my own list, we converted like 16, 18% or something like that. Then I think when all said everything was over, it was around nine to 10% or so. Oh, to, uh, the, to the cold traffic, nine, nine to 10%. Yeah, not really cold, but it was affiliate traffic right. and Facebook traffic, I'd say. And then kind of dropped a little bit from there. And my warm traffic, was, like for my own list, was the highest. But still with affiliate traffic was really high. And even the more we actually profited from the Facebook ads as well on that low end $67 offer, which was really impressive. And then we obviously made a lot more profit since I had my I had a had a premium program in the back end as well. So that's something you can think about how you can how you can do as well if you're yeah. watching this. So uh, that premium product, did you did you sell that after the summit was over, or was that on the tail end of the first purchase? Yeah, it was. I don't think it would work as well to do it right after a sixty-seven dollar purchase. There, hey, here's my you know thousand dollar course. That would be a little bit pushy. Sure. Like, I mean, maybe it could someone could make it work, but I think I wanted to build a little bit more trust there. At least could work with a one-click upsell after a sixty-seven dollar, but then it has to be more closer to the sixty-seven dollar offer, not like a big jump in price range. So I found. That we did it right after after the summit was over. The only thing I would have probably done differently today is to have let the summit as a big lead gen and you know getting sales for the summit in that case. But then afterwards, I probably would have waited a few weeks to be honest to kind of you know let the list you know we have built a lot of trust here. Don't like lose that with a big promo at the end, you know, which uh, you know you get a lot of unsubscribes. So I would have rather done that and have a lead up period, especially since my. Summit was not 100% connected to, I guess, virtual sign master. Yes, it helps with list building, but some people might have, might not see it as that immediately. So I would have uh, just had a bunch of case studies and stuff like that I shared after the summit, and then maybe leading that into either kind of a Jeff Walker style PLF launch, or I would have done like a webinar or something like that. I For this one, I did a webinar and we've done really well with that. It's just that I'm always constantly improving. So I'm trying to see where can we make uh, improvements on this process because I that was kind of I invented to actually promote something after a summit. Most people they just use summits as a lead gen, maybe sold an all access pass, and that's it. And then maybe months afterwards they promoted something, which is great. But you can like profit immediately and spend a lot more in advertising if you have that opportunity to have something in the back end as well. Cool. So to to sum up, you 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 might wait a little bit more time, like two weeks or so after the summit is over before. Yeah, okay. two to three weeks. I, I I'd say. I mean, I've tested a little bit. I mean, Chandler Bolt, which is one of my also big case studies. He hosted self publishing success summit. First one was back in 2015 when I really was involved, and then a second one in 2016 as well. But he actually hosted the 
I think it was like a 10 day summit. And then after it, right afterwards, or this, the very last day, he had a webinar to sell his premium course, self-publishing school. In that case, self-publishing success summit and self-publishing school was so directly related. And he actually got incredible success by doing that. And I think he had like 120 or 130,000 from the summit like pass. And then he had the rest you know, like in, he got in total 370,000 revenue. So he had over 200,000 basically coming in from just people buying his course from like a four day webinar promotion, which is pretty incredible, right? Yeah. So you have the summit getting that in and he didn't use deadline funnel, by the way, that was like before we started using this and I can just see the all access past sales could have gone up a lot. Yes. It's a little bit less than the 97, but you get so many more sales by using, you know, this urgency on the thank you page, which I'm really excited about. So um, just to get into the details, when, when someone comes in and they're reading the details, because initially they're thinking, okay, I'm just going to register for this virtual summit. This looks exciting. And then on the thank you page, you're, you're telling them, okay, you're... Um, First of all, language-wise, are you saying okay, you are registered, or you, or do you, do you language it like, um, you know, your your registration is almost complete? Yeah. So actually, this could be live depending on when this goes live. We have here actually setting up my current my my last summit list building school. We are gonna make it evergreen, and deadline funnel obviously plays a very big role in making it evergreen. And uh, so maybe depending on when you go to listbuildingschool.com, it will actually be live. And you can actually walk through and see what we are doing uh, with this. But uh, yeah, on the thank you page, we actually be having a small message there up top or something where we say hey, you're registered, but don't close this page or something. Basically, it's telling them, hey, this is important. This is an urgency. And we also, we also stack the offer there. So we have, let's say, uh, the recordings, obviously, of the summit. We offer that there. We also have some uh, very uh, interesting bonuses. So it's an irresist irresistible offer. So people are like, okay, I can grab this. It's 67 bucks. It doesn't really matter. So they grab this. They're one time off. Uh, it's not a one time offer, but it's a, it's a very urgency to just, it's a, it's a one time offer in a way that they never see the 67, but then it goes up to 97 again. And, and this is kind of detailed, but how, how, how much time have you been giving people to on the, on the deadline funnel clock to make their decision? Yeah. yeah, so we have tested a little bit. Cody, I believe he's using 14 or 15 minutes. I also used, uh, I think we used 14 or 15 minutes. You can test a little bit there, depending on industry. Also, industries is really important that if it's, if they're not a season with these kind of things, like that, they might not even recognize the deadline funnel there on the page. Maybe you don't need the countdown. Maybe you have to test different things, but you can still use deadline funnel kind of get the, you know, to redirect them. You can have a message there. You just have to see a little bit. Well, so it's uh, in a way that you don't come across as too pushy to your people. Uh, so uh, maybe in some industries it could be a good bit 30 minutes to give them a little bit extra time. If they're not very tech savvy, it could take them that long to actually check out. You know, no, right. I get these messages sometimes that, hey, I'm in the checkout here, but I'm actually not really, I don't know if I'm going to have time to read this page. Some people are like that. So you might uh, want to give some extra time but I like the 15 minutes we got a few people who said they might need extra time but we didn't actually use uh, the deadline funnel on our checkout pages because we kind of you know if they go there they are very likely to purchase but at the same time you could use it on your checkout pa pages if you want to so if you want to do it actually real the entire way feel free to do that but I, I feel that people who are on the checkout page they will actually buy most of the time mm -hmm. if they take the, if they take their time to go there cool so um what was the next question? So, uh, what are some of the mistakes that you see uh, first-time virtual summit students uh, making? Uh, going too broad, I would say, with their summit mm -hmm. is a big mistake. Like, just you know, I can give you an example. Um, let's say they are in the health and fitness industry. I mean, there's a ton of there's uh, some uh, competition in that industry. But if you are going with a health summit or like a fitness summit or more broad. It's not going to do as well. So I, I like to give this example with my student Steph with the Women's Strength Summit. She could have gone with the Strength Summit, which is, you know, a little bit more niche than just the Fitness Summit. But she went with the Women's Strength Summit and did a lot better because of it. And now she might not, 
you know, she doesn't have to appeal to everyone either. That's the beauty of it. She appeals to the right people and she got incredible results. About 20,000 people signed up to her summit the first time she did it and over 60,000 in revenue. So it was pretty good success. And she used the summit actually to go into a new kind of market. She had a fairly successful blog, but used that to go into a new market and uh, being really niche. And that's what I see with a lot of my students, <laughs> like niching down until it hurts, then they are, they're setting themselves up for success. And also if they want to position themselves faster as an expert, it's going to be much easier to do that. You're not, if you're not a Ramit Sethi, don't do an online business summit, for example. He might be able to pull it off since he has kind of a course, you know, in the back end for it, and he has a lot more authority in that space, but you're starting out, don't do that. And even if you're not just starting out, do a more niche summit, you're gonna be better off with that. Like even Chandler did the self-publishing uh, success summit, you know, was kind of specific to his course, and that makes sense. And thinking of how you wanna use the summit as a starting point to build momentum further in your business. Cool. Um, are there are there any other uh, mistakes that you see first time virtual summit students make? Uh, I would say also with the the design of the summit, you just keeping it like not trying to reinvent the wheel. And that says said like we give people in our in my program even like templates, like exactly what you see on listbuildingschool.com or similar what Cody used. We give people something similar so they can pull this off without being a techie or a designer. Because I find that when you're going to position speakers on your summit or influencers, then they want to look good. They want to look good next to their friends or peers in the industry. And if you have like a crappy design or something like that, it's not going to be very good for your brand. So if you're starting out and can come out with a really great design, professional looking, you have almost everything is you you win there right away without even hosting your summit yet so i think that's a key so the design professional and also having kind of the you know building thinking about the long term like some people don't do that they just want people to promote for them that should not be the reason why you're hosting you should the reason why you're hosting the summit should be because you want to provide valuable content to people and if you if i have you on and i focus on that you will share like some really valuable content maybe around urgency, deadline following, all that, maybe having a tutorial on this uh, on my summit. And then you feel, oh, I crushed it. You know, people will find this valuable. Then you're going to be a lot more likely to share this uh, this interview or this uh, uh, presentation with your audience. So that's kind of something I'm trying to get to my students as well, because I see a lot of people making this mistake that they ask you know, right away in the in the first email they send to someone, uh, you know, that they should promote it and so on. But that's not how we do in VSM and my my students. We, we, we focus on the long term approach and we see a lot more of our influence actually share our summits with their audience because they think it's so valuable. So that was, that was something I was going to ask. I'm glad you went there. So when, when you get a, an influencer that where you know that they're going to deliver really good content, um, you're not hitting them up to promote it to their list, it sounds like. And not immediately. I'm not like right away. It's all about building the relationship. And you can even start a little bit before if you have that time. You know, you can start, you know, getting on their radar, you know, maybe talking to them on Twitter, being on their list or something like this. You know, just add value to them. Maybe you read their book, you know, share it with them. You can be on their radar. So when you're reaching out to ask them to be on your summit, it's not such a big ask. You did you're kind of already like online friends, so to speak. That I mean I I never went to meet anyone in person when I first lived in Sweden. And uh, then later, like a few years later, I met a lot of people in person, but that wasn't the case in the beginning. So I had to kind of make friends online. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. So you can do the same thing. And then when you're reaching out, keep the first email short, maybe get on the call to get to know each other for like 10 to 15 minutes. And then you can also bring up on that call, like how, depending on who it is, obviously if it's an A-lister, like I mean, I have this A, B and C-lister, it doesn't mean you are less worth if you are in C listed in an a lister just like different rank in terms of the audience size you have and an a lister they might might have been doing it a lot longer but c and b listers they're a lot more likely to share it out with their audience because they're still looking to build up a listers take a little bit longer i found but you can still if you can get on a call with someone you can ask how uh, is it a good fit in you know whenever you've had in in mind to do your summit in September to share this with your audience if it's a good fit, obviously. So that's how I did a lot for list building school. Even people who didn't really know me that well said, yes, I think I had a 80 to 90, around 90% actually success rate in terms of people who shared the summit with their audience. So 
You know, that that's kind of what I'm trying to get across to my students to just have this approach to, you know, even if they don't share, so what? You wanted them on because of their valuable content. So that's what you should focus for, on first and foremost. And uh, then you still get people who will share it because of your authentic approach. And, and I'm curious, do you have your your influencers, your speakers, do you have them sign a release form as part of part of the process? Great question. I knew that my <laughs> would come up, but uh, actually I don't. I'm pretty, I mean, because you wouldn't have your friends sign a contract unless it was like a consulting agreement or something like this. But like for a podcast interview or something, maybe you would have a media release in your email like that you own the content. But really, if you, most of the time, if someone came to me after a summit and said, hey, you can't use this anymore. I mean, I, I would probably, okay, <laughs> I would like take it down because right. you kind of said yes. But, you know, most people would know. There might be some industries that you might have to explain a little bit more. But I would say in the, in the R industry, kind of in the online marketing space, people are very familiar. When you do a summit, you kind of under this kind of a understanding that you can actually be the, the interview will be sold might come out in books but that's actually promotion for you because you can share in your case deadline funnel or Absolutely. whatever you can share that so it's not bad to be seen and uh, it, it's like so i've seen some industry there have been some discussions in my community about this too that some people they might think that hey i'm giving away my entire knowledge in 30 to 45 minutes but it's not the case, right? If you only have 45 minutes of knowledge, knowledge to share, maybe you shouldn't be charging so much for, for it either. So that's kind of my approach to it. Like spend 45 to an hour giving all you got. I mean, you, you probably still have a lot more to give to people who want to uh, take it further with you and buy and pay you money. Sure. So um, if, if people want to get more information, if they're interested in doing their own virtual summit, um, I noticed on your, on your website, that you've got um, some free resources. So can you can you tell us about some of those free resources and where they can get them? Sure. On my website, depending on when you are viewing this, but right now we have a, a virtual sign mastery blueprint. That's kind of usually always available. You can grab that uh, over at uh, navidmoases.com or navid.me. Uh, and then also on virtualsignmastery.com, we run a free workshop about two times a year and uh, you know right depending on when you're watching this again then you can sign up and get access to this but still there should be some free resources around my website about virtual summits you can see some case studies there too of uh, some of my successful students actually in the past 12 months alone we've generated hundreds of thousands of email subscribers and millions of dollars in revenue from summits and the back end some people are launching membership sites on uh, in the back end of their summits courses and uh, affiliate products and all that kind of stuff so you know if you are wanting to grow your list you know want to build your uh, authority influence and revenue then i think it's a really good way to do that with a virtual summit yeah i'm i'm very excited about it and and i'm i'm talking with my team about uh, putting putting one of these on as well which brings me to this question maybe this is a good good place to end um how how far in advance should someone be planning um the the summit I would say it depends who it is. Like I've had people who have a bigger team. They might, you know, want to do it and, you know, maybe start planning in terms of their affiliates they're bringing on. Start a little bit like far in advance, like maybe five months, six months. But it, it's just a planning stage. But I think for most people, you know, when they're getting into it, three to four months. Uh, I have, have students who have done it in six weeks successfully, really well. Uh, it just depends like how much time you're spending on it. But I've had people have full-time jobs, they have pulled it off. I have people who have uh, several kids at home, they have pulled it off. And uh, so it's not really no excuse. I usually I see p when people are coming to me and sometimes they say, it's gonna take me a lot of time, but yes, it's gonna be hard work, but anything that has a very big ROI usually is hard work, like you're gonna do a product launch. It's not easy, I mean, I'm doing one right now for the fall, <laughs> so it's gonna be a lot of work we are putting in, we have copywriters, all this, but like when you're starting out, you can just like do it because you know this is gonna pay off for you. And uh, so I think for you, your, you and your team, uh, Jack, it's gonna be pretty good. You can do some really cool things since you have a software and like bundle that with training and stuff like that. It's like si similar to what Teachable and some companies are doing. I think you can do really well with this model. Yeah, we're, we're really excited. And, and, and to that point about everything worthwhile requires effort. I mean, we tell, it, we tell the people mm -hmm. that as well because you know, <clears throat> deadline funnel and setting up an evergreen funnel takes time it takes energy but it's the type of thing that keeps paying off day after day week after week so 
yeah, I, I can totally can totally relate to that. Go, go yeah. ahead. No, I just said uh, like in terms of you mentioned Evergreen, that's kind of where deadline funnel really comes into power. Yes, we are using it on the you know live summits as well, like on the thank you page. But I mean, you're using it on the Evergreen summit. You don't only need it on the thank you page, but also need it on the speaker pages to kind of make it expire. So that's something re I'm really excited about. That we actually just starting to implement this even more. Cody is running his summit kind of evergreen right now, the content promotion summit. But we are doing a little bit more in terms of the deadline funnel. So it's like more urgency there to, you know, depending on when they click in the emails and stuff like that. And that we are making an entire process for my students how to implement this because it's, it's some technical things there, but it's not anything you can't do. Like that's kind of the beauty you're doing the summit, but then you can actually have something that can keep generating opt-ins and sales. Let's say you're doing Facebook ads. Well, you can break even on that, so you can actually just get opt-ins for free pretty much, which is kind of the idea we have, but also getting people who promoted my last summit, List Building School, to come in again to maybe share it with their list. So I can have ongoing opt-ins coming in, depending on whenever they wanna promote it, they can just share it because we know already that the funnel converts really well. Yeah, and and you could even um, you could even set up just like we talked about at the beginning. Once it, once you evergreenize your virtual summit, you could have that two week waiting period and then uh, put them into automatically into the campaign for say a yep. uh, a promotion for your premium course. And so all of that could be automated. You could be automated exactly. So that's something I'm really excited about. We've never really uh, you know explored evergreen too much in terms of my virtual sign mastery program. And right now it's only like two times a year or so we open up like to the general public. But some definitely something I'm considering to see how we can you know have because there's always people who want to join at other times. So I'm still feeling the struggle. Like yes, I want to have the two enrollments like a college class, but then also Eh, sometimes I'm like, eh, maybe I want to let people in because they, they really want to do it. So they are action takers and I don't want to like hold them back from taking my course just because it's closed right now. <laughs> At least I feel that way since it's an online program. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so check out virtual summit and, or also yeah. navid.me and we'll, um, we'll add those links um, to the page where this, where this uh, interview is. And Navid, I wanted to want to thank you very much for your time and for sharing uh, your expertise and your experience about virtual summits. Sure, it was a pleasure being on.